So, tonight's sermon, a little bit different sermon. Sometimes when holidays come around, I like to preach on specific holidays when there's Mother's Day or Father's Day or Easter or things like that. I like preaching a sermon that kind of goes along with, with those days. And we actually have this, this day coming up tomorrow, this holiday coming up tomorrow that I like to call um, Atheist Day. Of course, tomorrow is April 1st. And some people call it April Fool's Day, but I like to call it National Atheist Day. <laughs> and the reason for that is that the Bible says here in the chapter we just read, verse number one, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And what is an atheist? An atheist is someone who believes, literally, theist is, is the word for God, and a means none. An atheist believes that there is no God. According to the Bible, they're fools. Now, what you'll notice about the atheist is that many of them will see themselves as being very intelligent, very smart people, very full of wisdom of this world, and, and will be rather condescending to people who are of faith, people who believe the Bible and have a tendency to talk down to, to people like us and God calls them fools. And God calls them fools for good reason. And I'm going to cover a little bit about the fool and a little bit about the rich man and the rich fool and things like that because we need to understand this, first of all, and not be um, bullied or pushed around by people who are atheists because a lot of times they'll, they'll um, want to talk about things or maybe talk about things in areas where you may not be an expert in, but you don't have to be an expert in all these various areas to understand that the Word of God is true. Amen. First of all, just understand that there is a God. Yeah. Step number one. The Bible says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You're, good, you're doing pretty good if you believe that there is a God, that you believe that there's one God. Right? Even the devils believe there's one God. The atheists don't believe that. Now, there is a distinction, I believe, also. There's someone who may say that they're an atheist, but deep down, I think, knows that there is a God. But there are those people who, in their heart, they believe that there is no God. There are people who actually subscribe to that and believe that. Some people may be an atheist of convenience. Maybe they run in crowds or circles where it... it is uh, beneficial for them to just kind of take the easy route and, and, and go along with it and play along with it. But deep down, they may really honestly know that, hey, there is a God. And many atheists will, you know, when, when confronted in a, in a very perilous situation, will often end up still trying to say some type of prayer or something along the way when, when push comes to shove and they find themselves in really difficult situations. But the Bible says the fool said in his heart, there is no God. Now, why are they foolish? Well, because uh, first of all, there is so much evidence given to us. And, and I'm going to go into this a little bit because it can be frustrating trying to deal with people that are atheists because we love people. We want them to get saved. Amen? Amen. I want atheists to get saved. I want, I want everyone we come into contact with basically to be able to get saved and receive the Lord. But atheists can be very difficult. And we need to understand the fool enough to know how much time we should be investing, but also just, just where they're coming from and try to, try to be able to, to balance this so that we can be effective at reaching them. But one of the reasons that makes it so difficult is their pride. And that's the case with anybody, atheists or not. When someone is lifted up and full of themselves and full of pride, the vast majority of the time they're going to be unreachable by you or me because they're full of themselves. They don't need anything. 
They don't want to recognize anything. It's going to be hard to even reason or rationalize with somebody that's just totally full of themselves. Usually people like that need to be humbled and brought low and then introduce the gospel and then try to, to, to get them to see the truth in God's word. Unfortunately, that's what needs to be the case for many people. And we see examples of that in Scripture. Look at Nebuchadnezzar is a great example of that. There's someone who is full of himself and lifted up with pride. And God had to basically make him like an animal for seven years when he's out in the field before he finally just realized, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm really nothing and there is a God and, you know, and this is who he is. And, and that, that brought him down. That, that struck a chord. That brought him down. And this is one of the things that we ought to be doing, and I believe in our prayer life, if you know someone who is full of pride and lifted up and full of themselves, one of the best things that you can do is to pray for those people to be brought down very low. Even though it may seem to be a, uh, a more of a curse than a blessing, it truly is and, and should. The, the goal is for it to turn into the greatest blessing that there can be. When you think about it in the grand scheme of things, I would much rather pray that some friend, some loved one, just some person that I know would end up losing everything that they have in this world in order to gain their soul, in order for them to receive eternal life and to be able to then pass the rest of their eternity in heaven with God as opposed to Oh, no, I want only good things to happen to them so they can continue being lifted up and full of themselves until they die and go to hell. Right. And then they'll really be brought low and have to deal with an eternity of, of being in that condition. Amen. It's much better if, that, if that's what needs to happen for people to just to have them brought low. Now, why is a person a fool if they say there is no God? Because the evidence is all around us, as I was beginning to say. Anybody who truly believes in science, science is 100% compatible with Scripture when the science is true. When, when, you know, science is the study or the pursuit of knowledge. There's nothing wrong with science when you're, when you're trying to find out what's true and what's right. And everything that is true... You should be able to demonstrate that. You should be able to see that. You, could, you, could, you can see these things. And everything that science can prove, none of it goes against Scripture. None of it will because the Bible is true. There's not going to be a contradiction in truth. Truth is truth, right? The tr whatever is true, whatever is right and true, it is true regardless of the source, right? Um, and when I say the source, I think all good things are all, all truth ultimately comes from the Lord. This creation comes from the Lord. But we can observe this creation. We can observe different things that are true. So whether a scientist is uncovering some truth about the way things work on this earth or whether you're reading about it in Scripture, the truth is the truth. Which is also one of the evidences just for the Bible in itself being the Word of God is when you've got a book like this has, has only proven itself true to myself for over 20 years since I've got saved. Year after year, experience after experience, time after time, the more I read, the more I study, the more I learn, not just about the Bible, about everything, the more this just rings true without fail. Every single time. Everything, everything that is put forward in this book is 100% true. It doesn't fail. It doesn't falter. How can that be of man? I mean, even so-called science. I was having a discussion earlier this week with somebody regarding science. And how much, you know, it, it, it boggles my mind how the atheist wants to just cling to science and science has become their God. But it's so easy to look at the history of science and things that were believed to be fact and say, we know this to be true 
20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, has changed. But it's science, so we must believe it. There's always some new studies, some new techniques, some other variables. Oh, we didn't consider this. Oh, we didn't look at that. We didn't test this enough. Now we found that this is actually the truth. Now, oh wait, now we found this. What's the latest study? That's the latest truth. The problem with that is that truth doesn't change. Science changes. Now you can say, oh no, there's these, there are established things in science. And, I, and you know what? There are. There are some things that have been established and, and been steady for, for quite a long time. And you know what? That's real science. That, that's all that is. All that is is that there's real science that exists. There are real things that when, when, they, when, when they're discovered or identified, given a name, this is how things work. Because ultimately that's all you're doing is just trying to make sense of all the rules and, and put it down in a, in a logical format that, that people can read and share with other people, but it's still just an expression of truth, of reality, of the way things are. It's all they're doing is identifying what already exists. It's nothing new creation, new discoveries. It's not a new discovery. It's, it, well, they're, they're uncovering something that's all already there. It's not like any particular scientist came up with it. They're just recognizing something that already exists. And that's what science is. And like I said, when it's true science, hey, it's truth, that's great. Turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 12. But the, the, the evidence that a creator exists is all around us. Any person genuinely interested in science, in the way things work, in looking at life, in looking at things, in looking at the, our world around us, the deeper you look into things, the 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 more that the only conclusion you can come up with is that this has to be by design. This has to be created. Th there, there is no way, there's no way possible to even believe it. It, is, it is illogical to think that everything that exists today happened by chance when you look at the order of things, when you look at that, that, there it, that you do not get more complex things out of chaos. You do not just, just start coming up with, with, with better, improved things that, out, of, out of just randomness. Right. It doesn't happen. That's not observable in, in anything that we see around us. That's not the way the world works. Yet that's the way that their, um, their assumptions are based on and their evolutionary theory and things like that. The people who say that there is no God, see, that's when their science turns into religion. Because they don't, they don't want to believe in God. They can't believe in God. They say there is no God, so now they have to come up with other explanations. As soon as you get rid of God and have to come up with some other explanation, well, now you've gone into falsehood. Now you've gone into what you believe. Now you've gone into just other areas that's not real science. Because it's not true. And I don't want to get into all of the different ways in which just studying science can, uh, can prove God's existence. You're just showing a design, but it's, it's fascinating. I love that stuff. I could go on and on and on for hours about it. Science has always fascinated me. I'm, you know, I, one time I was giving a gospel to a coworker a long time ago uh, in Arizona. And it was, uh, I believe he was Vietnamese and he, wasn't, he didn't speak English very well and um, of course, his culture was uh, like a Buddhist culture, you know, some Eastern religions. And when I had I'd taken him out to lunch because, you know, I didn't want to be on the clock or anything like that. I wanted to be able to do everything on the up and up. And he was going to be getting ready to leave. So I took him out to lunch and just, just went and decided to give him the gospel. And he was uh, very nice, very friendly. He didn't, he didn't get saved, but he was astonished because I was mentoring him. I was, I was his boss. I was supervising him. I was instructing him. I was telling him how to do these various things. And this, is, this job was a, a computer programming job, which is one of the things I do outside of church. 
and it's a it's a high level of, of technical capabilities right things that, that you have to uh, be able to think a certain way to do and and you get a lot of people in those types of fields that you know many people are not saved and are atheist or, or believe in evolution and things like that so he was astonished to say well wait a minute like you you believe the bible he's like <laughs> and he was kind of laughing about it not not being rude or anything but just he's like but he, he couldn't he couldn't reconcile the way that i was able to think and do my science for my job versus my religion and what i believe One of the reasons is because that's just what you're taught. And that's what he was taught is basically just that, oh yeah, religion is for dummies. It's for people who want to, they feel like they need a crutch. They need something to just help them along. If they don't understand something, well, this makes you feel better. Right. There's nothing more condescending than hearing, oh yeah, you, you know what, I don't, I don't have a problem if you want to believe in that and if you want to believe in your Bible and you want to believe in your God, if that makes you feel better, right. Right. go ahead and, and, and believe what you want. Just don't hurt. I mean, as long as it's not hurting anybody, you, you need that for yourself. If that makes you happy and comfortable, go ahead and believe that. This is their way of reconciling how anybody can believe this is true or know that that God's word is truth that's the way that they have to go about reconciling it in their own minds which in itself is very arrogant and proud and puffed up looking at someone as very much not nearly on the level that they are intellectually because phew, how could you believe in such a thing how could you believe such a book when in fact I can't speak for anyone else, but in my, in my own pursuit, I wanted to know what was right and true. Back when I was still searching, I was only interested in the truth. It didn't matter what the outcome is. So no, I wasn't looking for something to just comfort me and oh, well, here's an answer that I could just cling to. It's not what I was interested in. I genuinely wanted to know what was true. Back when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, before I got saved, I was willing to look anywhere. Hey, let's see if this religion, let's see if this philosophy, I took philosophy classes, I took religious classes, I went and, and went to different things and studied different religions. I just want to know what's true. I want to know about the world around me. I want to know what's true and right. That's how I came to my conclusion. I didn't need a crutch. I need someone to make me feel better. But it makes the atheist feel better to be able to dismiss that someone can actually have a brain and can actually think and think logically and understand science and understand these things and still put their faith in God's word and know that God is real. It makes them feel better to want to put you down to believe that. This is where they're coming from. You're in Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 15. The Bible says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. It is hard to provide counsel in the form of the gospel to a fool. Because the fool's way, it's right in their own eyes. They think everything's good. But you need to be willing to be able to listen to someone else. See, when I was pursuing truth, I didn't already think I knew it. <laughs> I didn't already think that, well, no, this can't be true because it's just a fairy tale. I ah, listened to it. Listen to what, what anyone had to say. Why? Because I wanted to know what was true. The fool, I don't think they're really interested in the truth. Proverbs, flip over to Proverbs 18. We're going to see some verses here about fools. A few more verses about fools. And just some things to be aware of 
because you don't want to waste too much time on a fool. These are ways to identify the fools. One is, you know, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The way of fools right is in, in his own eyes. Proverbs 18, verse number six, the Bible says, a fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction and his lips are the snare of his soul. The fool's lips are ready for a fight, ready to enter contention, argue, debate. But their own mouth ends up being their own downfall, their own destruction, a snare to their soul. Turn to Psalm 73. We'll spend a lot more time on Psalm 73. Psalm 73 talks about rich fools and people who are rich and proud and lifted up and full of themselves oftentimes might have a way of gathering a following, getting people to wonder at them and think maybe a little bit highly of them anyways because they're already <laughs> presenting themselves as someone who's lifted up. And oftentimes people will look at that person and just think that they should be lifted up because they're just walking around lifting themselves up. And we don't want to fall into this trap or look at them or envy them, envy their position, envy their wealth, envy their uh, prosperity. Look at verse number one, Psalm 73. The Bible says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of of the wicked for there are no bands in their death but their strength is firm they are not in trouble as other men neither are they plagued like other men therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain violence covereth them as a garment so he's saying I was envious at foolish people when I saw their prosperity I saw how good things were going for these people and I became envious Hey, they have everything so good. I want some of that. I, I, man, must be nice to be these rich fools. It says there's no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. There's, they seem to have everything going for them. They seem to be strong all the way until the day they die. They, they are not in trouble as other men, and they're not plagued like other men. They, they don't have these worries. They don't have the same problems that you and I have. They seem to have everything together. Everything seems to be going well for them. And because everything's going well for them, because they don't have all these problems, they're like, oh man, I've got one problem after another coming my way. But these guys, not a care in the world. Everything just seems to be going their way. And it says, therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Yeah. It's easy to get lifted up in yourself when things continue to just go well and well and well for you. And you're not brought to a position where you need to rely on someone else. You're not brought down. You're allowed to just keep puffing yourself up, puffing yourself up. Verse number seven, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. Again, people look at people like this that have all these riches and they become envious of them. And it's not right. And we're going to see that in this psalm. Verse number eight, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, as people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them and they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Basically, the attitude of I can do whatever I want. How's God? Who's God? How's God going to know what I do? Don't care. Everything's going good for them. What God? Remember, Pharaoh was like, who is the Lord? When Moses said, let my people go. Who, who's the Lord? 
I could keep treating you guys bad, and who's going to see it? Who's going to know? That's the attitude of the people who are fools, lifted up in themselves, full of wealth. And the psalmist here is saying, I was envious of them. To be in that position, to have that wealth, to just be able to live and seemingly have nothing going wrong. I mean, up until the day they die, they don't seem to have the problems that I do. Man, it must be nice to be in their position. They could do whatever they want and get away with it. They could kill somebody and say, the glove doesn't fit. You got to quit. <laughs> right? I mean, you could, you could get away with whatever you want to get away with. Verse 12, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in this innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. So he's saying, why am I cleansing my heart? It's in vain, right? These guys are living wickedly. I'm cleansing my heart in vain. I'm washing my hands in innocency. And he's saying, but all day long, I've been plagued and I've been chasing every morning. Why do I have to deal with all this stuff? They're getting away with everything. Verse 15, if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against a generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. So basically he's saying, why do I have to put up with so many problems, so much things when they can just get away with everything? I want that life. That's what it's like being envious. Don't fall into that trap. These extremely wealthy, rich fools that live wicked lives, that don't believe in God, they're not saved, they're trusting in themselves, they're lofty, they're lifted up, everything seems to be going well with them. Well, you know what? They have an end. So don't wish for their life. Don't look after them as, as someone to model yourself after or to try to get to their status. You don't want anything to do with that. Verse 18, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. He says, it's not until we went into the sanctuary of God, oh, now I understand their end. They're going to die and go to hell. That's why God allows them to get through this life, sometimes seemingly without any issue, without any problem. Because everything that they're doing here, it's all going to get paid for in the end. It balances out. Nothing is overlooked. Nothing gets by God. It's all going to be taken care of. But see, when you're born again, when you're a child of God, you're going to be chastened. You're going to be disciplined. My kids have a father that look out for them. It may seem like, man, every day my dad is just on me. He's, he's chastening me. I have to deal with this stuff. I got work to do. I've got this to do. I got, you know. But that, you know, the kid down the street, they could just tell their parents whatever and what they want and they get to rule their own house and Man, it just looks so great. Destruction's coming for that kid. Right. Right. Now, even if they, I mean, regardless of salvation, you, you know, any parent that just lets their child off to do what they will and just, and just to allow them to get lifted up and to have no consequences, destruction's coming. Right. They're going to end up making their own bad choices. They're going to end up in a really bad spot because they don't have someone that loves them looking out for them and teaching them right from wrong. It's not always the easiest to deal with the chastening and to deal with the hard times and deal with persecutions, but it is the right way, and it is the best way, because the end of these things, for us, way better than anything even temporary in this life now. All the riches in this world, 
You say, oh, but I just want to be so rich. I want to be able to go on vacation. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to travel. I want to get a boat. I want to get a plane. I want to live here, live there, do all this stuff. Nothing compared to what heaven is going to be like, compared to what the afterlife is going to be like, compared to the rewards and the mansion that you're going to get that Jesus Christ has prepared for you. You just have to understand that that's coming. And even in this world, we get in, to experience the best things come to those who wait. That's why it's a slogan for, for Heinz ketchup, right? Because it's a truth that they've tapped into that they've been able to use to sell their product. But it is a truth. Waiting for things. Waiting to have that relationship with a, a man or a woman until you get married. Hey, what a blessing that is. Instead of just giving into your urges and going off and, and, and committing sin. No, there's an extra blessing. There's a special blessing when you could wait, when you could do things right. So many things. When you can just wait, when you can put your nose down. How about this? Instead of uh, looking for that get rich quick, buying lotto tickets, going gambling or whatever, trying to get that quick buck, why don't you just put your nose down and just start working? And just work hard. And start working and working and working. You know what? One day before you know it, you'll have the blessings. And, and you know what? Those blessings are going to be sure, way more sure, because you've invested the time needed to get the job done and then to just to, to have that solid foundation to keep going forward and keep, keep uh, continuing on and on as opposed to the here, today, gone, tomorrow. That's why you see the people who win the lottery. I, I don't remember what the statistic is. I'm really, my memory's bad on stuff like that. But there's so many people who actually win, the, win these big prizes end up going bankrupt after a very short period of time. Why? Because they don't know how to manage their money well. Why? Because they're going out and just buying stupid lottery tickets. <laughs> Right? They don't know how to, how to manage their resources and what they have, and they end up just, just way overspending and not managing it correctly, and it just all ends up getting blown, and they're back to where they started from again. And it did no good from why? Because they didn't do it the right way. When you work for things, when you earn them, that's going to allow you to understand how to manage them properly. But um, I digress here. Let's turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 19. I don't even remember exactly how I got off on that tangent. Matthew 70, or excuse me, Psalm 73 is a great passage showing how the, um, why not to be envious at the wicked, at the rich, the rich fool that seems to have everything when you understand their end. Just rich people in general, this is, not, this is not where our eyes ought to be. It's not where your heart ought to be. Right. That's right. Jesus said this in Matthew 19, verse 23. Then Jesus said, and then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. A rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. There's not going to be very many people in heaven that, that were rich in this world. He explains that a little bit. He says, and again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. That's a pretty strong statement to make. I mean, the eye of a needle is very, very small. Very, now look, I don't, if you've heard this garbage about, well, the eye of a needle is really a, a gate in Jerusalem. and it, No, an eye of a needle is the eye of a needle. He's using this language to, to just demonstrate something that, that is very strong language, right? It's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, essentially, right? It's not going to happen. And that's what he's saying. So, when his disciples hear this, they don't say, well, if the camel just gets down on its knees, you go through, it's, I mean, that's not that big of a deal. No, because they're like, well, they're exceedingly amazed. Verse 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, well, who then can be saved? Well, if it's that hard, then who can even be saved? 
But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible. Impossible. But with God all things are possible. So is it possible for a rich man to get saved? Yes, it is. But how hard is that? It's very hard. Why is it so hard? Because they're full of themselves. Because they're lifted up with pride. Because they don't think that they need a Savior. They don't think they need a God. Everything is going well for them. When everything's going great, what do you need from anyone or anything else? That's the attitude that people generally have. You're comfortable. Things are going fine. Things have always been going fine for me. So what do I need anyone for? And that is one of the hard things to deal with when you're dealing with someone who's either rich or a fool and trying to, to present the gospel to them. Um, Proverbs 14, verse 7. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Proverbs 14, 7 says, Go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. I says just to, just to avoid it. Don't waste your time. And I, honestly, this is one of the biggest time wasters that Christians these days can do is getting involved in these arguments on the internet Amen. with atheists. Which is just so ironic how the person who doesn't even believe in God is going to tell the Christian how, what they ought to be doing, right? I love it. I love it. Just, it just makes me laugh like every time. Oh, shouldn't you be doing this? Or you shouldn't be wearing mixed fabrics and you should be, you know, what about shellfish? What about shell? You know, all this stuff. You don't even, you don't even believe in a God. You don't even understand the Bible. They don't understand the Bible. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. Obviously, there are answers for all of those things. And very simple answers too, by the way. And, and if anyone was actually interested in understanding and wanted to have a legitimate discussion about things to understand why someone believes what they do. You know, they don't just throw these things out there. But when people just throw nonsense out there like that, it's like, you didn't even study. You didn't even care to look at what we actually believe. You're just going to throw out there whatever you want. Disingenuous. That's why when I try to preach against certain doctrines, and preach about, you know, what, if there's a false prophet or false teacher or some false doctrine that exists out there, I don't want to misrepresent what I'm trying to show as being false. Because that's not going to do any good. Because then if, you, if someone were to believe some false doctrine and say, well, that's not what I believe, then you've accomplished nothing. Then you just get involved in vain jangling and arguments that are just have zero profit whatsoever. If, you're gonna, if you have an interest in, in either persuading someone or helping somebody, if that's your genuine motive, motivation, you're going to want to reach those people with, um, with where they're at, with what they actually believe. Your, your average, your common fool or atheist, they don't care. They just want to badger and call names and make themselves look smart and make you look stupid and, and that's it. And you know what? Don't fall for the bait. Don't fall for the trap. Don't be so lifted up and pride yourself that you feel like you have to defend yourself and everything. That you, you don't have to do that. When you don't see the lips of knowledge, just turn away from them. Go from the presence of a foolish man. You don't need to worry about it. And what I would do and what I have done and what I will continue to do is to pray for these people who are so lifted up and full of themselves that God will humble them and bring them low. Not because I have a vendetta against them, not because they offended me and made me feel stupid or, or made me feel bad that, that I'm a believer and they, they called me names. That doesn't bother me one bit. I don't care. I actually care about them and I want to see them get saved because they are so blind that they don't realize that destruction is coming. Matthew chapter 7, look at verse number 24. The Bible says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came 
and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. One of the common things I hear from the fools that don't believe in the Bible at all is that well, the Bible, you, you need to understand the context. You need to understand the culture. You need to understand, that's an old book. Maybe it worked back then, but you know, times have changed. Things are different now. Uh, one of the things I heard recently is, you know, it talks about slaves and, you know, you need to treat your slaves well. And this is the common atheist attack on the Bible. It's like, no, the Bible actually doesn't say slaves, first of all. I know there's, other, there's multiple versions of the Bible. But it's hard enough to even try to get through to the fool on, on these details, which are very important details, by the way. They're not just some, oh, well, no big deal. They'll treat it as not a big deal, but it actually is a big deal. Say, so, well, don't you know the Bible endorses slavery? No, it doesn't. It doesn't endorse it. There's laws about having servants. There's laws about uh, things like that. There's laws about how a man ought to deal with a wife when he's, when he's taken multiple wives. That's not an endorsement. It's a law. It's a law regarding real life situations. But again, the, the fool doesn't care about that. And see, they want you to change with the times like they do, like their science does, as I mentioned earlier. When you've got science that just shifts with each new study, with each new discovery, oh, now this is right, oh, now this is true, that's shifting sands, my friend. The fool's going to build their house on the shifting sands. Right. And look, this is a fact. You could look it up. And, and how many things today... In 20 years and 30 years and 50 years from now, are people going to be looking back with even more technology and being more full of themselves and going, <laughs> can, can you believe that these people were, you know, injecting poison into their kids and they thought that it was healthy for them? The same way that, that we can look at, can you believe that they were bloodletting and, and actually removing blood from people's bodies thinking that that was going to help heal them? That was accepted science. Now it just sounds foolish. And, and just continue. I don't care how far back you, you can just keep going back through time. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you will keep finding things that were accepted as being true that are foolish now. They're foolish. Those are shifting sands. I don't want to rest my faith in that. I'll put my faith on a rock. Something that doesn't change. The Word of God is eternal. The Word of God has been around forever. Now, it may be hard for some people to grasp that concept, but even in the 4,000 years of its written existence, um, it doesn't change. And it doesn't need to change. It doesn't need to change to fit different cultures and different societies because the truth doesn't need to change to fit anybody's culture, to fit the way that you live. No, the truth is the truth. It doesn't matter what year it is. It doesn't change. Another common argument is, well, do you know how many times the Bible's been rewritten? Actually, it hasn't been rewritten. I don't know how many times I've seen that too, heard that. It's just been rewritten. Well, which, you know, which Bible? It's been rewritten so many times. No, it's been copied down many times. If you want to call that rewritten, okay, but I think that's a, a really poor usage of the word because rewritten is going to imply that you're, you're changing it as you're rewriting it. Yeah, you could say you're writing it again when you copy it. Okay, it's kind of a stretch, but you might want to be a little bit more clear with your words when you're describing it, a copy 
and a copy and a copy and a copy and a copy and a copy is not changing the source. It doesn't change the book. And they want to, they, they have this mindset where they think that like, I don't know what they think. They, they must think that like one copy is made every 20 years or something and that it's only like one, like you have one Bible yeah. and then that gets copied down and then that's the only one you have. So if there was a mistake there, then every other one, you're going to keep on having it. That's not the way it worked. Copies were continually being made. Copies and copies and copies and copies and copies, different copies. So yeah, there may have been some errors, some mistakes along the way on some random copy, but that doesn't make the, the whole thing just, just everything is based on some incorrect copy. It's not the way it works. The more copies you have out there, the easier it is to determine, well, hey, this must be true. I mean, okay, here's a mistake here because these other 10 say the same thing and this one says something different. And we can see what they did there and this is clear, but yeah, all these other ones say exactly the same thing. And especially when you have a document, when you have something that's being copied that's not some novel, that's not just some story, but it's actually what you believe to be the Word of God, how much more careful do you think you're going to be about your job? And who do they employ to do these jobs? This, isn't the, this wasn't the, the low-paying, minimum-wage job. Oh, here, you're, you're a scribe, you're a copyist. We'll pay you the least amount. No. These were learn, learned individuals, intelligent people, that were actually doing the copying. This isn't just some, some you know, entry-level job that people were getting into. It actually required some, some effort and some smarts to do this. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is the last place I'll have you turn. Like I said, it's a little bit different sermon in honor of, of um, National Atheist Day tomorrow. A few different goals for why I'm even bringing this up. Why am I preaching on this? One is just to understand the fool a little bit so that, one, you don't get sucked into their, into their nonsense. Two is understand them enough to be able to um, make the right prayers or potentially approach them in, in a manner that might be useful or beneficial to, to preach the gospel unto them when you know where they're coming from. But again, not wasting too much time the Bible doesn't speak very highly of fools. In fact, it's, it's basically giving you a lot of admonition to just not really deal with it at all. Answer not a fool according to his folly. There's a, there's a lot the Bible talks about with just basically avoiding fools in general. D and don't get wrapped up and, and caught up into their snares. But let's see what the Bible says about wisdom and about knowledge and the wisdom of this world versus the truth from God's word. Look at verse number 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. What a dichotomy. Amen. What a difference there. The preaching of the cross, the preaching of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, says to those that perish, it's foolishness. They think that we're the fools. You fool. You think you believe that some flying spaghetti monster in the sky sent his son to die on a cross and pay for your sins. They think it's foolish. But on us which are saved, it's the power of God. We know it's the power of God. We've experienced the power of God. I know I have. There is no doubt, no doubt in my mind that this is truth. This is something that can be known. I was speaking with someone who said that the, the you know, longer he's lived, he feels like he, you know, what he thought he knew ends up being wrong and he, and he doesn't know. And sure, I could see that because his foundation has been in 
science. And his pursuit has been in science. And the more he's learned about particular areas and, and different fields, the more he's realized. He's, and, and this person has is, is gotten at least far enough along the way to understand that science changes. And as he's gotten older, he says, well, the one thing I know is I really don't know that much. But because he doesn't know that much, and he's been around for a while, he finds it hard to believe that anyone could know anything. Preaching the cross, people like that, it's foolishness. This is the power of God. We can know. I do know. I know that this is true. I don't think it's true. I don't believe it's true. I know it's true. Not a shadow of a doubt. There's a lot of things I don't know that are true that in different scientific fields. I know. I know this is true. It's the power of God. Verse number 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Again, this is the end. This is what God's saying he's going to do. I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wise. The wise of this world, the people who look at the preaching of the cross as foolishness, God says, I'm going to destroy that wisdom and I'm going to bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. To prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It's saying when God saw that this world's wisdom basically ends up rejecting God and knows not God, God says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to save them by preaching because they think that that's foolish. So part of the humility in your salvation, you're going to have to deal with and accept something that you might have considered to be foolish. Right. You have to be humble enough to receive that, to receive preaching. Just like you have to be humble enough to receive salvation itself, to, to, to understand, I'm not good enough. I can't earn it, can't pay for it, can't do anything. I have to just be reliant on God to give it to me. I can't get it myself. You have to be humble. You have to be humble to be able to receive it by preaching, by hearing some crazy guy with a Bible tell you why this is true. It's the way God made it. He sees the wisdom of this world, and it is foolishness to God. So he's saying, you have to become a fool in order to actually have true wisdom. Verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. It's this Greek philosophy that still exists today. Seeking after the wisdom of this world. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, under the Greeks, foolishness. The people who are seeking the wisdom of this world, it's foolishness. Pure foolishness. Verse 24, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. When we see that are called in context, this is referring to people who get saved. People who, are, who become saved, you're not seeing many noble people, many rich people, many people who have the wisdom of this world that end up being saved. Why? Because they're lifted up and full of themselves. Verse number 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. See, the, the mighty people will look at the weak people, the poor people, as sometimes almost even subhuman. Right. Or just, you little peon, what do you know? And they judge people based on their wealth, 
the things that they have. Oh, yeah, you go to your church. You spend your time, you waste your time reading your Bible and praying as if that's going to do any good. But if it makes you feel better, go ahead and keep doing that. That's the wisdom of this world. That's the foolishness of this world. Verse 28, And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God said, I'm choosing to use the weak and beggarly and poor and, and you know, foolish things of this world in order to come to me because you're not allowed to have any, any room to glory. You're not getting into heaven because you're so smart, because you've studied so much, because you've learned so much, because you're so intelligent and you figured everything out and you mapped it out and you did your, your um, proof to prove it all beyond any doubt that this is true and this is correct and this is accurate and you're so smart you're able to figure it out. That's not why you're getting there. It's not because of how smart you are and how good you are or anything like that. You can't glory in God's presence presence. Verse number 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You want to glory about anything? Glory about God. Glory about Jesus Christ. Bring honor unto his name. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. You'll be able to recognize the fools. Don't waste too much time on them, but I would recommend if you can mm. it's hard to find a recommendation. Just like any other heretic after their first and second admonition, the Bible says reject. You're not going to win them over with science. That's not going to work. Their faith is too steeped in science. The gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek that seeks after wisdom. It's the power of God. Look at that. Just like any other person, anyone in any false religion, the gospel is what's going to get them saved. Don't become wrapped up or distracted with the atheists that want to just cause fights and cause strives and Maybe try to make you look stupid. Oh, you don't know anything. You're not very wise. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. I'm not saying not to be smart. I think we ought to be educated. I think you ought to know about the world around you. I, I, I like science. I think true science is great. Understanding and looking into God's creation will help you understand even more. But don't get sucked into... The, the philosophies, the vain philosophies and the deceits of this world that are, that are brought forth by fools that have a mindset that there is no God and that that's their starting point. Well, they're way off from the beginning. So take it easy with the arguments, especially tomorrow, We'll let the, let the fools have their day and uh, don't get wrapped up into too many arguments and, and vain deceits. But hey, you know what? Maybe you could try giving one of them the gospel and see, what they, see if they could receive true wisdom. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this wisdom and instruction from your word. Lord, help us to use this wisdom wisely and... and um, 
Help us to be able to remain humble. Lord, let us not be drawn into a um, pride for pride argument where some fool will approach us and try to hurt our pride. Maybe we shouldn't have it to begin with, Lord. Um, help us to overcome our flesh that's going to want to demonstrate how smart we are in this world to people who want to challenge us, to the fools that want to challenge us, Lord, because that's really not important. Um, and I, that's not how we're going to win people over anyways. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to have the humble spirit that says, you're right, I'm nothing. Yeah, I'm weak. Yeah, maybe I do need someone to, uh, to comfort me. I, I'm, I'm not as strong as, as maybe you are. But uh, help us to have the right, humble attitude that, uh, that Jesus Christ had. And um, honestly, tonight, dear Lord, our, our goal is to reach as many people as possible. And we also don't want to, in so doing, we don't want to waste our time. So help us in that endeavor, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.